facts shanta ji shanta ji believes very much that institutions and the state cannot wrong the children they need to bootstrap and work such that the state works to save the children and their rights and i invite uh, shanta ji to release the report a future at stake and share her visions with us uh, welcome and sincere thanks to you professor shanta sena thank you thank you manisha i must thank the national coalition on the education emergency for uh, uh, asking me to release this report i do it with a sense of full hope and responsibility uh, and i think uh, if only these voices are heard lives for children would be much much better than what they went through during the lockdown you know th th these are very very difficult times and we have seen through several studies that have been made on what happened to children that uh, they live lives of precarity total vulnerability this report consolidates all the studies and research that have been made i have believe that they must have spoken to several ngos on the ground policy makers educationists and others to come up with sturdy uh, uh, recommendations which must be in fact internalized absorbed uh, and put to action in a manner that we restore our uh, children uh, their dignity their freedom and their rights a lot of wrong as manisha said has happened to children during covid in fact i would say that all the gains that were made before the lockdown were just dumped totally lost if you look at i will not quote statistics but i must say that in the last decade there have been tremendous gains that were made in terms of education of the marginalized the weakest the girls Uh, the tribals, the Dalits, the Adivasis. Of course, it wasn't the best for them, but there was a trend in in which we, the children were moving from one class to the other, and there was some element of seriousness about the education system and how education system was be going. There were so many girls who, in fact, aspired for more. Uh, you know, and you find that there were many girls who completed eighth grade, who completed tenth grade. who were looking for what to do after 10 and there were new hopes there were new aspirations new dreams in from that kind of a mood you find during the lockdown there has been a total collapse this is what i think onisha had so uh, well uh, shared with us but i would like to just repeat again that it has been a very very bad condition for children many many children uh, were out of school because of closure of Uh, schools all of them wanted to be in schools all of them wanted to be with their friends all of them wanted their bus rides all of them wanted to study they wanted to dream big they wanted to be with their teachers but you find that overnight they were all dumped uh, into their own homes uh, and with passage of time i find through the kind of uh, uh, i mean um, discussions i've had and contacts i've had with children you would find that these children have been forced into work you find millions millions of children uh, going into farm work sometimes into their own farm sometimes into farm work for others they were on chili farms they were on cotton farms uh, uh, they were on uh, plucking limes they were plucking vegetables you know and sheer hard work from morning 5 Uh, to twelve in the afternoon and again in the evening, with blisters in their hands, blisters in their feet, and when they went home, there was nothing to eat. In fact, this was a total disaster because when there were schools, there was no meal program. Children had some food, some predictability that they could have their lunch, but this was not possible. When they went back home, there was hardly any food, and over a period of time, the quality of food in their house diminished totally. they had only some grains and perhaps some onion and some chili there were no vegetables there was no oil there was no dal the quality of food was zero and totally i think children some of them were even starved the older children had directed to us how they had to eat only once in a day i mean this is something which didn't happen even in days of abject drought and poverty you know that kind of a situation 
who was listening to them girls were abused were pushed into marriage for whatever reason i will not go into that but i think her her their lives was also very bad but since i mentioned for whatever reason i would think the reason is a total complex state complacency or lack of seriousness about the state uh, 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 into looking at what was happening to children there is no discussion in the policy rules there was no debate uh, anywhere children were just not on the radar that nobody no policy maker was looking at the implications of not having noon meal not having education of schools being closed down absolute total insensitivity to what was happening to children during this time and i think i would put the blame uh, 99% of the blame on this rather than talk about it being yes children were poor this poverty and therefore this has happened let me tell you that children cannot bear the brunt of their poverty it is for the state and the state's resources that has to sort of rescue them from poverty give them all the best that can and work out schemes in fact it need not even be centralized it could have been decentralized it could have been gram panchayats uh, who could have taken responsibility for the children they could have a greater trust with the ngos around and certainly children could have been taken care of but who cared who looked at children who talked to them who found out what was happening to them nothing nothing of that sort it is much later after some 15 months we had studies coming up we had articles we had research but until then voices of children were not heard we were totally blind to children and their uh, uh, predicament so the hunger there was child labor there was child marriage there was sexual abuse there was irritability there was anxiety there was trauma there were within the house the tensions growing up between family members they had no soap to wash their hands they, they, they didn't have enough clothes because they had to use the same clothes to work and then come back home in fact i must tell you that it was a horror horror situation for children and there was no discussion or conversation about them anywhere at the policy circles at least now i think we are in a position where there is some noise about schools reopening and this report will tell us that schools reopening does not mean schools reopen to pounce uh, upon children and start getting them to learn the three r's or to continue from where they left 2 years ago so much has happened in their lives one has to be sensitive to that to not take it from where they left 2 years ago but to take it from where they are now and then build upon that to bring back self esteem to bring back confidence and i think it is possible and doable that is what this report says it gives concrete steps on what has to be done and what has to be done need not be done in a sequential manner i have seen some reports which says that you do this first then the second then this third no leave it to the teachers and their autonomy leave it to as manisha said each individual and her predicament and maybe the sequences will change depending upon what the child is where the child is perhaps one would have to focus much more on a child's health mental health even before one would come up to sort of putting them onto reading and writing there are many many things that have to be done as intervention for each and every child there has to be a plan every child has to be tracked there is no need to do more research on where these children are all their names are on the attendance register we all know that 99% of children there, uh, there has been an enrollment of 99% of children this is what the government talks about when talk about victory of education that means 99% of children's names are already there in the attendance register with their addresses all they have to do is find out where these children are and make individual plans for these children to get back to school in addition many children are facing huge problems trying to stick to the private schools and we know what kind of situation and exploitation there is in many of these unaffordable local private schools they are all thronging back to the government schools the government schools are going to be full full of children from government schools full of children from private schools government has to be ready for doubling 
their resources to do what they can to get children back to normalcy. But as I say, doubling their resources, in fact, if they do not do so, the loss is going to be acute, irreparable. I mean, there was no that if one whole generation would be lost for the country, for the child, if there is an inaction of the state. The cost of state inaction is going to be tremendous on children. They're going to be, again, with lack of confidence, lack of self-esteem. They would not know what their path is for the present. They would not know what their path is for the future. And it's unimaginable what kind of trauma these children would go if they did not have the education they deserve. And we will have to work harder than before to bring back normalcy. It cannot be the same program. It cannot be the same it cannot be the same inputs. One will have to be more imaginative and in fact consult children, consult community, consult parents. As Manisha said, children do have a voice. They have an agency. So they will, we will have to talk to them and I'm sure there would be solutions that would come out of it. I will not get into the solutions because the report has made it so explicit, so clear, and I would like each one of you to go into what is there. And finally, I would say that I'm glad that this is happening. I always believe that when truth is told, it has to be told many times. It has to be told 100 times, it has to be told 1000 times, and we must never get tired of saying the same thing again and again, because we have to keep telling the truth till it is heard. And so, I request each one of you, I request those who are in the press to make, make headlines, to keep repeating the same story. Don't worry that you're getting repetitive. It has to get repetitive till such time that children's voices are heard and children become center stage of India's democracy. Otherwise, there is neither future for children nor there is future for India's democracy. Thank you very much for giving this, me this opportunity. And I do wish that we all join hands to see that the best happens for children. Thank you very much, ma'am. Uh, this reminds me of the time when I was a PhD scholar and in the fields, and I would go to Shanta ma'am's place saying, oh ma'am, in Mahbub Nagar, children are not in class after uh, the midday meal. And it was, uh, you know, she would smile and tell me, go back again to the field. And when I went back again to the field, not found them there, and as she says, repeated my visit many times. Then she told me the big secret. And she told me the children were never there even before lunch, Manisha. That was the midday meal registers you saw. The children have all migrated. Why? Because a massive drought had hit the district and the administration had been hiding the figures because the drought would have meant additional responsibility for the state. So it was the vision of Shantaji, the lens with which she saw children, the lens with which she believed that children must be back in school. That's the lens. Children must be back in school. Their home and hearth must be together. Their parents must not struggle to get a bare meal and children must get their voice and agency back. And that's a claim on the state to do so. Thank you very much, ma'am. I uh, take this opportunity to welcome Sudeep Thakurji, opinion editor for the Amar Ujala and a longtime supporter of the Education Emergency Coalition. Uh, Sudeep Thakurji has uh, been very supportive with spreading the word and message of bringing the children back to uh, school uh, uh, and, and, and in the Hindi uh, reading world. Uh, Sudeep Thakurji has been, I would say, an ally to the cause that we've picked up and he's helped us uh, walk the mile and taken our message to places where we cannot go of our own. I also take the opportunity to welcome Pradeep Kumar from the BBC. He's also joined. Um, and, and with this and without much ado, I welcome Dr. Sajida Bashir, who's been an advisor uh, with, uh, formerly with the World Bank uh, at, uh, with the Global Director of Education Practice. Uh, Sajida comes with immense experience of, of the education field, of the laboring poor, in all of the developing world, if I may say, long conversations with Sajida over the years, uh, I would say now over 30 years of long conversation has opened up the world of the Asafala, the Asian, African and Latin American suffering poor and their children. 
it's uh, you know kudos to sajida's spirits that she decided to quit the world bank uh, on the day that india gained independence 15th of august uh, she was free from the work that she's done in her global policy roles and she thought it was time to come and support the initiatives of the kind that education emergency is and to work directly uh, with children of the laboring poor and dirtier hands with with the farms and fields and that's where her heart really has always been i now invite uh, dr sajida bashir she will be talking about the report a future at stake but also vignettes of her experience without much ado dr sajida bashir welcome to the education emergency forum and the future at stake comments from you please thank you so much uh, manisha and uh, thank you also to um, you know shanta ji i i was listening to her and really moved by her passion and the images that she evoked uh, about children uh, who are suffering and whose voices are not being heard um so let me explain a little bit about the motivation for this publication the national coalition for the education emergency as we then started calling it held its first meeting in july 2021 when schools were not still open and uh i you know who had been looking at what had been happening in the world was struck by the fact that even in africa schools had started to reopen in uh, january now of course we had the second wave and we had to be careful and so on but our first priority therefore was to get schools to open and then as we saw that state governments were starting to reopen schools much to our dismay we saw as uh, shanta ji said that very little attention was being focused on what had happened to children on the suffering they had gone through on the learning losses they had suffered which were devastating on the fact that you know the fact that they were hungry that they had lost um you know parents or relatives in this pandemic all this was barely being given any consideration instead a few of the guidelines that we saw emphasized health and sanitation measures for instance how do you clean the you know benches and the desks and so on honestly that took up most of the guidelines and just a few lines on how to recover from 18 months of school closures in a few states or a few cases state governments announced short duration remedial courses of one size fit all type of course or teachers were supposed to send notes to students so they could copy them out ignoring the fact all that shanta ji said of where these children were you know and we are pretending that by just moving them up two grades assuming they are up at grade level and resuming the tests book based syllabus and exams that we will be back to normal and it was clear to us that this approach would not be a meaningful education recovery for hundreds of millions of children in this country that is the magnitude of our problem and as shanta ji said a lot of research and our own knowledge from the field showed that yet across the world countries are modifying the curriculum and teaching methods even in advanced countries to enable children to reengage with education to focus on core competencies and to provide extra resources and budgets instructional time and effort to help the disadvantaged whereas in india we are reducing the expenditure on education and therefore we are going in the wrong direction next slide So this publication was prepared to help state governments to adopt an, a, an appropriate approach but also to help with the social mobilization effort and the public discourse on the recovery from a national calamity as shanta ji said the silence the public silence that has been there on this huge number of indian citizens is actually quite shocking and our messages are quite clear every child has to be brought back to school every single one of them we can't just say that this percentage or that percentage every single one of them has to come back and equity in this context means 
more effort for the disadvantaged, not the same. We need to provide enhanced nutrition. Children are starving. They're famished, you know, and we need above all to simplify and enrich the curriculum to focus on three areas, social emotional development, language and mathematics. And we need to take a comprehensive approach, not just leave the, the teachers to fend for themselves. And simplification does not mean dumbing down. It means enriching, but it means giving children the core competencies to be able to deal with the disaster that they have faced. Next slide. So the central message of our report is that focus on these three areas, social emotional development, language and mathematics competencies. Social emotional development is not a luxury. It is really crucial because as Shantaji said, children have lost so much. They have suffered personal tragedies. They've had little contact with caring adults outside of their parents. Many have suffered abuse or started working. And let us not think this is just the case in, in Jharkhand or UP. It's, it's also the case in the Southern states, even in the advanced states. They, we cannot also assume that just being back in school, they will somehow automatically resume how to focus, how to follow instructions, how to complete tasks, how to collaborate, how to regulate emotions. No, these must be taught explicitly, not as a subject, but across every subject. And children need to have the space to do that. The second big area is language. We really argue for allotting substantial amount of instructional time for language instruction in a revised curriculum. And we are talking of several years. We are not saying this should be, this is a three month or six month program. Just imagine, think about the situations that Shantaji described and think of the consequences for language. You need cons language competencies to cover academic language. Even for those studying in their own native Indian languages, they have lost touch with reading, writing, and even listening and speaking to express their thoughts and in academic areas. A large number of children in low-cost private schools learning in English have suddenly transferred to government schools, probably learning in a different language, it seems. About half the children in many states in government schools are also studying in English medium, a language in which they've had no contact for two years. And we expect them to go back and read the textbooks to, you know, two grades ahead. And think of those images of the migrant children walking back last year, not so long ago, walking back from the metropolises and going back to their home states and presumably studying in some, language that they were not familiar with. So imagine the complexity of the task facing the ordinary teacher, the high risk of dropout of children who cannot follow what is being taught. So we need extended time for language and an enriched curriculum. And similarly, we argue for more time on mathematics. Children have forgotten the concepts, not just the procedures. Let us focus on key concepts and mathematical reasoning and prioritize relevant content for each state. Next slide. So naturally, such a reorganization of the curriculum is required in order to actually simplify and enrich. And we need extension of the instructional time. Our publication therefore talks about, you know, really providing teachers guidance, not, not, you know, detailed instructions, but guidance on what to do, for instance, when you have extended time for literacy, the additional learning materials that are required, we need to prepare formative assessment tools, and we need to help teachers with regular support, possibly extending uh, uh, instructional time, maybe on weekends, vacations, hire more teachers or teacher aides. But as Shantaji said, Really, the responsibility is the government's. It needs, they need to provide additional financial resources, provide the technical guidance. They need to organize and coordinate and manage this massive disaster recovery effort, just as you would do if there were a flood, if there were an earthquake. Children have suffered 
worse than that. So school reopening should not mean business as usual. Let me conclude with a metaphor, leaving an image with you. Tens of millions of Indian children, I would say the majority of the 250 million children who are currently in grade one to grade 12, they are stranded on the other side of a yawning chasm. The bridge to cross this abyss is too steep and it's flimsy and it is being pulled up too fast. Many of our children risk falling and they won't, many of them won't even get on the bridge if we don't act immediately. We need a stronger bridge and every one of those 250 million children needs to cross over. Socio-emotional skills provides the foot grips and the language and mathematics competencies are the guardrails that will help them cross. They need the support of teachers and schools, the government and the entire society every step of the way. And we'd be happy to answer more questions about this at the end of this conference. Thank you very much, Manisha, over to you. Uh, thank you very much, Sajida. Uh, I have no words to summarize what you've said. Uh, you've placed us within our uh, comparator situations and I do think that the road ahead is one where we need to take learning more seriously, where we need to down the holes that we have, down the gaps uh, that we have at the site of the school. But what do we do of the bridges that we have burned? I think that's just so important for us to think back. It's about learning. It's about bringing the children back. It's about dealing with them with all the stresses that they've imbibed. It's been a very difficult time for the country, for the world. But remember, these are children who've also been under the glare of immense media pressure, talking about a pandemic here, a pandemic there. And in their own lives, many of them have seen the loss of their parents. Many have spent time uh, finding oxygen. It's like, you know, how I used to write about rural women going with their earthen uh, pots on their head to find water. That's how this time I found that there were young children who went uh, kilometers searching for oxygen cylinders for their parents. Some survived, some did not. There's no full stop to the misery and agony that children have gone through. Eight-year-old children saying, oh, I'm not going to go to school. I'm going to work because I've lost my father and my mother does not know how to work or she's not had a job or she's spent her time picking up the firewood from the jungles and even what the father ever got is lost. So this must be a time when we renew and re-engage. What better than to introduce to you the real backbone of our thoughts and, and, and then the person uh, who's been steering these activities and this type of thinking. Uh, this is Guru Kasinathan and uh, he leads the IT for Change initiative over 17 years of work He's worked with teachers and with schools, always in the background, but I think a formidable thinker and a formidable thinker because of, of the fact that, you know, he lives in Bangalore, he works in the IT sector. And in this entire lockdown, it has been said that IT is going to be the Nirvana. Digital is the way that children will learn. Till we realize that there were thinkers from amongst the world of the digital who were telling us that this is no good. You need to ask the questions. It is Guru who's led us together into a coalition. Without much ado, I welcome Guru. At the same time, I also welcome Manas Gohain from the Times of India, who's uh, with us from the Hindustan Times. We have Fariha. Uh, Jatin Anand is also joining uh, from the Hindu in New Delhi. Uh, so even as um, we have many cities, uh, newspaper uh, reporters from many cities have been connecting with me saying that tell us more about this world Many of them like us realize that the world of children has been lost and they do want to hear what the education emergency uh, coalition has put together. Uh, now Guru will present to you some more facets of the deep work that the education emergency coalition has done. There's the policy tracker in addition to the future at stake report. The policy tracker is going to be a live way of understanding how within the complex federal framework of India, the states and central governments are rising up to take the challenge of resume and renew our schools, how to build back India better for our children. 
And apart from the policy tracker, there's also the teacher speak. There is a priority on the element of voice. There is a priority on bringing back the onus on the state. Guru Kashinathan, may I now invite you with a sincere sense of thanks and with a sincere uh, indebtedness, I would say, to your stellar work in bringing us all together and holding us on to what appears to be the most important agenda as we rebuild our frayed society and its lost children. Guru Kasinathan. Uh, thank you very much, Manisha. Happy to be here. Uh, the National Coalition on the Education Emergency uh, was set up in July, and we immediately realized that it's a long haul because the tragedy that uh, we are in right now is something that will require the concerted efforts of all of us. Government certainly at the center in the state, but civil society, parent communities, and mass movements as well. And it's going to be a long haul. And we felt that it's necessary to get more and more people together. And that's why the idea of having a site that will help us to pool our resources, pool our ideas and experiences, uh, we created. And that's the education emergency site, which you can see on the screen. Now, the report that Sajita spoke about is available on this website, which is educationemergency.net. And if you go down on the latest updates, you can see a future at stake. So you will be able to download the report from this link. And this report, as Sajida briefly explained, talks about all the steps that governments need to take in order to ensure that our children have a future. In addition to the future at stake publication, we also have what we are calling as a policy tracker. Now, we, need, we realize that it's extremely essential to keep a track of what's happening. India as a cooperative federal setup, and we need to keep a track of what different state governments are doing across time. So initially in July, schools were still closed. And at that time, it was very important to keep a track of which states are opening schools. So Punjab and Andhra Pradesh actually started the process of school opening way back, but many states have only opened just now. So the first element that the policy tracker captures is really the school opening and school closed status across states and which you can see in front. So if you see high schools have been the priority for state governments across the country. So most states have opened and that's green in color except West Bengal, which is going to open a couple of weeks from now and Kerala, which is partially open. And you can see the conventions on the top. Lower primary schools, contrary to uh, wisdom of education and health experts, and this is what the tracker tells us, that education experts and health experts have been repeatedly saying, open primary schools first, because that's where the damage is the most. But you see from the tracker that it's the other way around, and state governments have prioritized 10th board exam, 12th board exams, and therefore open high schools first. So the tracker aims to give a picture of what's happening, and right now we are focusing on state op school opening and school closure. But as we go ahead and as schools open, it's going to be tracking the important elements that Sajita mentioned. Our midday meals being given, our hot cooked meals being served to students in the schools. Are they getting additional learning materials? Is there attempts to involve parents and communities in the teaching learning process? Tamil Nadu is doing that now. So we want to keep a track of different developments that are happening across states. And in a spirit of competitive federalism and to help states understand where, where others are and are to allow pure learning to happen, the tracker will talk about that. And of course, also untied funds that or additional funds that the state governments are going to commit to addressing the education emergency. So just already mentioned, India is in a very unhappy uh, state where education budgets are being cut. And the advocacy efforts of the coalition are certainly towards increasing education expenditure in the current year and the years to come and to make sure that we have enough resources that we are allowed that we are providing to schools in order to, for them to meet the challenge so this is a policy tracker and apart from the graphic visual uh, which will provide information across states we also have uh, the same information in a table and we also have information about basic uh, data across different states so if people want to research and analyze the status uh, of some of the parameters I mentioned, midday meals, additional learning materials, additional teacher support, community engagement, grants, etc. It is possible to do that analysis using the information on the tracker. Uh, <clears throat> that is one thing that the uh, coalition has been doing. Another important act 
the uh, activity of the coalition has been to collate research that's already available. And recently we did a study called the Teacher Speak and we interviewed, uh, we interacted with teachers in Karnataka teaching in high schools. And we, we want to be doing this Teacher Speak and perspectives of parents, perspectives of students across time in a repetitive manner across different geographies so that like Shantaji mentioned, nobody's really listening to the primary stakeholders of the education space and policymakers are going ahead with the decision making without really engaging with people at the ground. And the teacher speak uh, data that we have is extremely shocking. And you can see that we interacted with high school teachers who teach, teach classes eight, nine and 10 in Karnataka. Only 15% of graded teachers said that 80% of children are at grade level. So 85% of the teachers are saying that children are not at grade level. And unfortunately, the state governments are going to compel more and more teachers to follow uh, the grade level syllabi, grade level textbooks. And that we fear is going to create conditions for dropout. And already I think Sajita mentioned that other countries are not doing that. And this is something that will be a priority for the coalition going ahead. So these are two essential things that I want to talk about uh, to you. And uh, I hand over back to uh, Manisha ji. Uh, uh, thank you, uh, Guru. That's extremely precise. I will close by saying that if we just invert uh, the last slide uh, where Guru's given the numbers, uh, we will find that a majority proportion of the children have not gone to school. A majority are not learning anything. But if you look at the world in which they live when they do not learn and do not go to school, that world is scare inducing, it's fear inducing. I've been through many uh, meetings uh, with women on the ground soon after the first round of the lockdowns were eased up somewhat. Uh, you know, community level motivators had gathered women and, and women have complained of having one mobile phone on which all the children were supposed to do classes, the increase of violence, the increase of violence on women and the increase of alcoholism in households and children being witness to all this. There are uh, voices, and these were voices from Maharashtra. I've heard of voices from Jharkhand where an important vice chancellor of a university told me that students ran to her saying that one mobile phone and asking the girl child when she asked for the mobile phone to attend a class, she was told you're a girl and you go to college, you don't need this. The boy of the house has the priority. So the kind of violence that children have seen, the kind of reversal of household power relationships, I think that's clearly something that's taking us back to the dark ages. Remember, the progress of humanity is a progress of ideas. The 1945 moment was one where the resolution on rights was a consensus that was achieved across the world, the developed and the developing, the advanced industrial and those who had been cannon fodder to colonial power. All of them got together to a consensus on rights, a consensus on child rights, the path to realize these rights for children in the developing world, however, was much longer when socioeconomic rights began to become a part of the constitutional agenda, when voices of people like Professor Shanta Sena began to be acknowledged as the policy and institutional world of our country in one stroke, in one global pandemic, when the man-nature relationships have been nurtured, we find that that loss is immense and at the suffering end of all that are children whose rights we reassert in all the international covenants and conventions. And we do so as members of a democratic India, of a free India that has struggled for its laboring poor and for its children. So I uh, you know, applaud very much my senior colleague, Shanta Sinaji, Dr. Sajida Bashirji, and Sri Guru Kasinathanji. And I uh, invite now, uh, there are members of the press, if you want to ask questions, unmute yourself. Uh, there's also someone called Marzia who's in the background of all this from the IT for Change team, Guru's immensely effective team that works for their daily bread by day, but by day, moonlighting the time that they work and by night, by moonlight, they work to give children of India back the future that this pandemic has snatched but much of the agony they suffer now is because of our indifference. Let's rupture our indifference 
members of the press. Let's ask the questions. And as Dr. Shanta Sinha Ji, Professor Shanta Sinha, Panchri Magsasya Award winner said, repeat these questions till education of the children that has been lost becomes a part of the public agenda, becomes a part of the headlines. We are here to help with how to teach, how to think about assisting teachers, how to get, look at the socio, social health and psychological health of the young ones with the tragedies that they have seen. I invite members of the press, they can unmute themselves, introduce, ask questions, the entire panel is here uh, to answer those questions. Good evening, ma'am. Uh, it's Madhya. Uh, yeah. I'm from Kashmir. Yeah. So I just wanted to ask, like, it's not uh, something which uh, India doesn't know. The children of uh, Kashmir has not only witnessed lockdown since from two years, last two years, but they have been uh, witnessing lockdown from, I think, 90s. So what are the like uh, interesting factors which can be introduced in the education? in primary section or i would say primary classes so that their education will be more interesting and as they are spending most of their time at home what can be the most uh, you know the policies or uh, strategies the parents can introduce so that their children will not lack and in you know in future they can be they are they will be able actually to compete with the students of all over india Keeping the uh, suspension of uh, keeping the suspension of uh, internet in view. Yeah, thank you very much, Maria. Are there any other uh, uh, question from the press? We'll take a couple of questions. Any other questions from the press? Uh, uh, hi, Manisha Ji, Manas Bol now. Uh, Manas, please go ahead. Yeah, I want to know ki what has been the impact of the uh, on the, on the midday meal scheme during the pandemic. Okay. How would the That's... states manage that? Did, did they able to manage it the center and the states, or was okay. there some kind of other trend you have seen? Okay. That's Manas Kohan from Times of India. Uh, I'm going back to the panel now. Uh, Sajida Shanta Sinaji, uh, would you like to respond? That's Manas Kohan from Times of India. May I, I, as far as I know, there have been very weak attempts to restore uh, a wheel in one or two states. They did it for a month, uh, a home delivery of dry food rations, but that did not work at all. So in a sense that it was totally uh, lost and uh, children did not receive their good meal program uh, during the pandemic. So you can imagine how many, how much of brains would have been saved, how much of budget would have been saved, and how much could have actually been utilized during this time. Uh, Sajida, would you like to add? Um, Guru? Yeah, yeah. Uh, Guru can come in also uh, with uh, uh, the situation on the ground. I think after a, in the initial months of the lockdown, the majority of states did not supply food grains or any kind of uh, midday meals. And then I think after a lot of uh, mobilization, some of the states started at least providing the dry rations. Uh, but I think Guru might have more specific information about that. But I want to contrast that with what happened in many countries, which is that arrangements were made because of the, of the fact that children were facing hunger, you know, and their parents had lost jobs, that even if schools were not open, arrangements were made for delivering food or for, you know, people to be able to pick up food for their children. Such arrangements were not made in the majority of Indian states for months. And um, then a few of them did make it. Now what we need, and we will be tracking this, is not only the old rations, uh, but also the fact that um, we need to have enhanced food because children are really starving. 
you know, malnutrition is already at the rate of about 35% in the northern Indian states. And you can imagine how much it would have increased amongst young children. That has a direct impact on learning because children's brains don't grow if they don't get enough uh, nutrition. So this is one thing that we will be tracking very uh, seriously, but perhaps Guru can add something on that. Yeah, uh, very quickly to add, we know that India slipped in the global hung hunger index rankings. I think recently they were released, I think from around 94 or so, we have come to 106 on the global hunger rankings. And one of the reasons is the fact that we really failed as far as the midday meal scheme was concerned. Now, one very important point I want to bring up is the right to education is a fundamental right. The right to midday meal is an independent right of the fundamental right to education, which means it doesn't necessarily depend on the schools being open, like Sajita said. However, governments were very reluctant to quick hot cook meals as entitlement, but occasional dry rations have been supplied. And obviously, that is not at all equivalent of providing hot cooked meals. In Karnataka, for example, a PIL was filed and the High Court actually pulled up the state government saying it's a responsibility to provide hot cooked meals. And I think it's, uh, like Sajita said, we, the coalition will certainly push for the midday meals to be much more enhanced than what it is, not just pulses and grains, but also items like eggs or meat or fish and local fruits and vegetables are going to be very essential for us to surmount the very terrible situation we are facing on the nutrition scenario. And just on the first question, very quickly to respond, what should be done as far as primary schools are concerned? How can we involve parents? There are very specific steps and suggestions given the uh, future at stake. And we will share that uh, publication with you immediately after this uh, event. And you can get specific uh, information on the steps suggested in that publication. Uh, yeah, let me just add to the uh, midday meal uh, question here. Uh, uh, our own field work amongst the uh, vendors in Delhi and uh, domestic workers in Delhi and in Mumbai, both groups has told us that the lack of midday meal uh, provision in schools has led a large number of families to growing indebtedness. And there is a demonstrated inability to be able to provide even one square meal in a day. And therefore there is need uh, to come up with quick, quick and rapid surveys and the education emergency uh, coalition is preparing itself to have such rapid surveys. The entire process uh, is being put in place so that quick uh, answers can be found to these questions. Uh, Manish, if I may uh, let you know, because through fieldwork, we are figuring out the issues. And in some time, we will see quicker answers. The policy tracker, for example, that you see is giving you now a 360 view of what's happening in which states. Now, uh, that's something that's going to be a clear eye opener, because as you are aware, education goes through a federal labyrinthine in India, and therefore it's owned up by nobody. And that, uh, you know, once the policy tracker gives you a 360, you will be able to pin responsibilities in most spaces. But there's also space, as you can see, in our system, in the approach we have, to be able to bring out quicker uh, surveys on the ground and give you results of those. Jean Drez, who's been supporting the efforts of the education uh, emergency, is in conversation with all of us, not today with us on, on this press conference, uh, but another opportunity, and he will be there, has been doing surveys. The school surveys have happened in Jharkhand, and there are a lot of answers coming out uh, from his surveys as well, and those would also be available through the Education Emergency Coalition websites in future. I think that would give a synoptic overview of the ground level, worm's eye view with respect to things. Any other questions, members of the press? Uh, if, if are, are there, okay. Any other questions? So there's a question on the chat box, uh, Sajida and Guru to you. Uh, is the NCEE in talks with any of the governments and what has been the response? This question comes from Aparna, please. Uh, let me uh, explain this initially, and then Guru can also follow up. So um, the, uh, you know, 
the coalition started preparing or members of the coalition started preparing these guidelines and this publication as we saw state governments issuing orders about the reopening of schools, which were often just three or four pages. And as I said, mainly focused on sanitation measures. And so um, as initial drafts were prepared, we did start sharing them with some of the state governments that were about to open schools. So in that sense, we have been in discussion with the state governments, several of them, and uh, it is our intention to send this now more systematically to all the state governments, uh, particularly in the case of um, Tamil Nadu and uh, um, I think uh, UP and perhaps uh, Jharkhand, there's much closer interaction uh, with the state governments and I will hand over to Guru to explain how some of this is working. Yeah, so I think the first thing to be said, of course, is that uh, which Shantaji said in the beginning is that we did notice a considerable amount of, I would say, apathy and ignorance on the part of governments because when we started, it was like, you know, there is no problem. Schools are closed, so what? Schools will open and then we can resume schooling as normal. So I think, and that's also largely because of, I think, the popular discourse that opening schools is dangerous to children and old people and therefore let's keep schools closed. So that popular discourse was also the impression that state governments carried. And through our consistent engagement with state governments in Kerala, Tamil Nadu, Karnataka, uh, Maharashtra, and now uh, we would like to engage with Uttar Pradesh and other governments as well, we have been able to persuade them that this one-sided thinking that there is no problem, everything can go on as usual, and there is silence on the on the emergency that we are facing that we have been able to disturb and the guidelines itself like sajita ji said that governments have been issuing very administrative guidelines which we understand and we've been persuading them and to some extent successful in making them look at the academic aspects and the additional funding aspects of school opening but a lot more needs to be done there's no doubt about that any other questions or uh... Any other questions? So uh, I'd like to take this moment now to thank everyone who's uh, uh, given up their engagements for this evening and joined us in this, uh, what I still say, public discourse in our attempt and effort uh, to turn the issue of the lost lives of children, uh, the loss of the very meaning of childhood and you've gathered together this evening. It's the prelude to a Diwali, uh, which is always an effort to re-energize, renew our engagements once again. This time around, uh, let's spare uh, a moment and let's spare our thoughts and focus on the lives of the children, the lives of the laboring poor, and the losses that many have suffered in our country uh, in, in, you know, with our folded hands, in our prayers, in our memories but most importantly, in our thoughts, in our critical action, and in our efforts for the future, let's try and rebuild that India, that the founders of India, that India's uh, struggle for independence always imagined. Remember, as much as there was a political struggle, there was also a struggle to educate, to educate those minds and build those minds that would be free from fear as much as there were political leaders leading the march of people, there were also the poet laureate, Ravindranath Tagore, uh, whose grace and eminence at remaining uh, the educationist ever. And of course, that long list consists of many others who uh, uh, were not perhaps in their stature as big as Ravindranath Tagore, but they struggled with local circumstances and situations I'll not try to build an endless list. It consists of men, women who struggled across castes and communities uh, to build a democratic world that was more uh, free and egalitarian for their own children. And those struggles were struggles of public-minded individuals. Those struggles um, included uh, the struggles of uh, Gandhi himself, Sri Aurobindo Ghosh, uh, there was Sarojini Nayatu who was uh, writing the poetry. There was Ramdari Singh Dinkar, 
who was writing the poetry and asking for social justice through his poetry. There was Kuempo in Karnataka who, whose heart bleeds and says uh, that, you know, there cannot be a ridiculing of uh, India. And he gave his life uh, to the cause of modern education going down to Kerala. Um, uh, the Wakam Malvi himself who uh, imported uh, a press uh, of his own resources and started printing textbooks, translating uh, textbooks into Malayalam. And remember, these struggles under colonial rule led his press to jail. So I believe very much that this is roughly the same moment, the time around the World War II, when people around the world, especially in Asia, Africa, and Latin America, the laboring poor, work to give us this world and along with it a dream. And that dream is that of a mind without fear. That dream is a dream of freedom. Today, the future is at stake. And let's go back to the 1945 moment. Let's dream of a free world. Let's dream of an egalitarian world for our children. Let's go back to the schools and let's think of the laboring poor and their children. Thank you very much, Shantaji. Sincere thanks, Sajida, sincere thanks, Guru, sincere thanks, also Marzia. And with these words, I'd like to close. If there are any more comments, you can put them in the chat box. Feel free to connect with us. Uh, your emails are with us. Your WhatsApp with, is with us. And uh, without much ado, let me say good evening, good night, goodbye. But do so with a good thought for our children once again. Thank you, everybody. Manisha, if I may just add that we will be sending out the press release and the document to everyone who's participated in yeah. this uh, event and others, and really hope that uh, you can make it front page news, <laughs> because I think the fate of 200, over 200 million children deserves to be on the front page. Thank you. Uh, Shantaji, would you like to say a concluding line? No, I, I just, uh, uh, I would like to just reinforce and reaffirm what Sajita just said, that this has to be made uh, front page news for as many times as uh, needed. Uh, and I do hope these voices are heard. Okay. All right. Uh, Manishu, Guru, I'll just go back to what you said. Let's rupture the indifference. I think you said it, and I think correct. that's a very powerful call. And Chanta Ji's, let's keep telling the truth because only then it will be taken seriously. I think these are two powerful takeaways for me from this uh, event. Yeah, thank you very much. And in thank talking you. about this truth again and again, we hope the press will be with us. So thank yes, you. Yes, no, no, of course. Right. right. They're with us, ma'am. I think today we've been joined by all the leading national newspapers, the BBC. Yes. We've also been joined by uh, the Malayalam press. And uh, lots of Sudeep Thakurji has been here. Uh, so leading lights of the Hindi uh, journalistic world have also joined us. Sincere thanks. And I uh, now bid goodbye. Would you like to close? Bye, bye. Yeah. bye ma'am. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sajida. Thank you, Guru. Thank you. Thank bye. You. Thank you very much to all. Want to stay back, Guru? <laughs>